What about the book, Walter Kern's book, appeals to you? Um, let's, let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, well, firstly, do you want me to hold it? or Firstly, um, um, the book, I, it felt real. It felt like someone who was being generous and sharing with me their life, their problems, their funny parts. It didn't feel like I was being manipulated or was some contrived or made up or no one was fucking with me. It was the real thing. And at the same time, it was um, very funny and very light and knew how to use the ridiculousness of life um, to open doors to get you into more vulnerable places. So it was very good at using humor to open you up to be r exposed to darker parts or harder parts to deal with. And so that's what initially attracted me. And then shortly I kind of realized my, my mother had just passed away and I realized that, whoa, 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 this, this story, this family is a lot like my family and that I really identify with Justin and the relationship with the mom, there's a lot about it that I can really identify with and that reminds me of my relationship with my mom. And so when I started adapting it, it became a lot about that. It became about me and my family. And, and my dad, you know, the facts of my parents are completely different and the facts of our relationship, but the emotional under score, under structure, it has some real similarities. What, what about the end? I believe you changed the end from the novel. Talk about that, how that comes about. Um, well, there's lots of, there's lots of, the movie, I mean, the book takes place over four years and there's lots of sort of subplots that aren't in the in the uh, movie. And one of them being uh, the whole family becomes Mormon at a certain point in the book, which is a great thing in the book. And I was in my script forever. And it's not out of love for that part of the film, part of the book that I didn't put in the film. It's just too hard to have the family go in and out of Mormonism in 10, 15 pages of a script, you know? Um, so that was the only reason it didn't get in there, but it was with great regret and great desperation of what am I going to make now to make, you know, the end. But the, the end end, the real end, is as out of the book, when he's in the airplane and what happens to him there. That's, that's in the book. Lou uh, Lou, um, what really got me about Lou is that he's a real kid. Like, I mean, he's a great actor and he's an actor, but he's also very much a 17-year-old. And his first airplane flight in his whole life was to my audition, and his second airplane flight was to our film. And he was 17. It was the first time he was living away from home when he was shooting our film, much like Justin's position. He had his 18th birthday party in the night. We shot this crazy scene of him in the hotel room with the girls, you know, naked and all that. And so it really, he, he was really the guy. And then Lou was great at not faking it and not being unreal. He really showed his real emotions. He really let the film happen to him. And so when you see him crying, Lou is crying. And when you see him happy, Lou is happy, you know? And it had that kind of purity to it that I think really jumps through to people. It's not, he's not putting an act on. He was not intimidated by the big cast. Well, I think he, he anybody would be, right? And he, he, Lou is a very strangely brave person, but if he was intimidated or if he was nervous, he didn't hide it. Or he didn't feel shameful about it. He just let it be a part of what was happening to him at the time. And he just integrated it into what he was doing. So that's, I learned a lot from Lou watching him handle fear and fame and intensity and all that kind of stuff. And he, he was nervous, but he just let it be part of his, of his life. And, uh, but somehow, yeah, he went toe-to-toe -to -toe with all these really intense actors doing intense scenes and like really being in the crazy energy with like Vincent D'Onofrio and Keanu Reeves and Tilda Swinton and, and it didn't unravel him. And I still don't know quite how that happened, you know. He has quite a mood arc in that film. Describe that with the, the character Justin and how Lou handles it. Yeah. I mean, Justin, the character goes through, yeah, like you said, like a big transformation. He starts off quite sort of closeted and quiet and unarticulate and clogged, let's say, and sucking his thumb, literally plugging his mouth. And then he gets off thumb sucking and he, and he sort of has a, a crisis and he gets put on Ritalin, sort of maybe, maybe not mistakenly diagnosed as ADHD. And he explodes and he becomes quite articulate and he sort of finds a new part of himself and, and gets quite straight and strong and, and, and intense. And that also collapses. It's like a big you know, arch that he, he rides over. And then he falls into another sort of replacement, really, for his thumb sucking, which is smoking pot and having sex with this girl and becomes obsessive about. 
And all these things are really sort of mass and substitutions for the original thumb sucking, which he lost at the beginning. Um, and I don't know, you see Lou, I think he goes through quite a journey, but it's kind of subtle in a way. Like his actual performance and stuff is, isn't really histrionic, isn't like huge expressions. A lot of it's internal. Um, and basically at the end, he, he comes back to thumb sucking away, or he, um, he finds a way to deal with himself without having to change. You know, he finds a way to be happy with himself without, without having to be someone else, which is basically what happens to everybody in the film. Uh, who has that classic look? I was thinking, of just thinking about it now. He looks like a member from like the '60s band Nico and the Velvet Underground. He's got uh -huh. that Italian American kid, white, pale, white skin, that long hair, skinny boy. I mean, I'm sorry, it, 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 it's just a comet, that heroin look, you know, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and it's a classic kind of look. And at first it's all buttoned up, and then, of course, he, he, he takes his shirt off. Yeah. And it, that's, that's a profound thing, too. Talk yeah. a little bit about preparing an actor who's never done that sort of thing to do that so gracefully as he does. Well, uh, I mean, that's really easy with Lou, because Lou's a big ham. So Lou will do anything. Lou will take his shirt off. Lou will jump around naked. Lou, that's not a problem for Lou. Lou's... Um, you know, Lou was in The Sound of Music on Broadway. Let's not forget that. So I think a lot of that comes quite naturally to him. And he's in a very, that, I think maybe that's why I like him. That's why I thought he was good for Justin. That's why I identify with him is because he's both very internal, very mental, very shy and crazy. You know, he's not afraid to be insane and out of his head and, and, and kooky. So uh, that I didn't have to prepare Lou. I had to prepare everybody else for Lou, you know. What do, what do you think, I'm going to ask him, but what do you think the hardest scenes for him was? Um, I think a lot of the scenes were hard. And, you know, he's in every scene, so uh, some of it's just exhaustion, too, or just the roller coaster of doing that every day for, for that long. Um... I think some of the scenes with the Rebecca character where he gets broken up with and all that stuff, I think maybe some of that, you know, he had to really, that's a place where he kind of got hurt, you know, and where he had to go into feelings that actually hurt him. And I think that uh, with, I don't know, you should ask him. I'd be. I wish he was here. I'd be curious to know his answer. Um, I think he has a hard time being an asshole, and there's certain points when Justin turns into an asshole. And I think that that doesn't come naturally to Lou, and that's it makes him uncomfortable doing that. Um, yeah, talk about the subtext of Lou in those debates, of Justin in those debates, the character that emerges from that. Yeah. Uh, so when he when he gets put on. Ritalin and sort of becomes this overly articulate and strong-willed person. He is also flourishing on this debate team that's led by Vince Vaughn. And he, um, it's like, you know, he spent a lot of his life being meek and over s overlooked and in the shadows. And all of a sudden the door opened and he storms into the room and everybody's listening. And as that often happens to, you know, when you're that age, he eats up the power maybe a little too much and gets a little too full of himself and a little uh, overbearing and, and crazy and also <laughs> maybe abusing his pharmaceuticals a little bit. Um, so it's the thing where the shy person is secretly the biggest egoist you ever met. That gets revealed in that, in that moment. And I think you see, I think it's important, you know, when people describe his character, Justin, as you know, like um, alienated or um, uh, lost, uh, I think maybe he's alienated, but he's, he's not just lost or aimless. People call him aimless. Um, I really don't think that's true at all. He's actually one of the more willful, determined, um, struggling, striving, going forward people in the film. And definitely just in my life, if I met that kid, he's, that's a strong-willed kid. He may be flailing. He may be going in all sorts of wrong directions, but that's different than, than aimless. He's definitely got a drive, you know? 
one interesting thing is in this film, you luck out and, and you're, you have the creative sense to do it. Uh, you have actors, uh, big actors around him, uh, Vincent D'Onofrio, Keanu Reeves, and Vince Vaughn, each of whom are archetypes of the type of characters they're playing. Yeah. And that Justin is feeding off of in some way. Yeah. He's becoming a brash, kind of bully-like character opposite Vince Vaughn. Yeah. He's becoming kind of hippie-like out around Keanu Reeves. Yeah. He's, he's, he's dealing with the father-son thing around Vincent, Vincent D'Onofrio. Yeah. I mean, this is just a, an amazing kind of thing to have the guys themselves instead of some pale imitations of those guys. How does that come about that you get this dream male cast? Um, well, it's a funny story. It's a um, in trying to get this film financed, it was very difficult, and um, it took years. And during those years, I was having meetings with financiers and distributors, all of whom were saying no. And without exaggeration, if you think of a film distributor or financier in North America or Europe, they said no to Thumbsucker. Like, everybody did. And that's a lot of people, and it takes a long time to go to each of them and hear them say no. So that took, like, a couple of years. And very depressing, very hard, very, you know, I've never had something so hard and dealt with so much rejection before, you know. And simultaneously, the, fil the script's going out to actors and agents and people like that, and it's developing a whole kind of life just within the actor world. And more and more and more actors are getting attracted to it, and I guess they're talking to each other, their agents are talking to each other, and it's like having its own strange, funny life with the actors who all really liked it or saw it as an opportunity to, well, not all, but many, you know, really saw it as something to jump onto or to get to try things they haven't gotten to try or go deeper than they got to go. And uh, in meeting with them, I had such a great time meeting with so many people, more than are in the film, that it was like my save, my saving moments because I'd have these financing meetings that are really depressing and really scary and really like, it's like going to God and God keeps saying no. That's like not a fun thing to do. But then you go home and you get to meet this nice actress, nice creative person, and you get into this really revealing emotional conversation about both of your families and, and vulnerability and it's like really refueling, you know? And it just kind of slowly built up to the... So I got to this kind of crazy caliber of people who are, who are into being in the film. Talk about Vincent first of all, Vincent Nogra, how he comes on and what he brings to the film. Vincent, you know, you have this, you get this list of people. And Vincent was really one of my very first guys to go to. And because I really like, I really didn't want either of the parents to be considered dumb. And because the parents do have sort of, there's limitations to their parenting. They're not perfect parents. I didn't want anybody to think it's because they're dumb. And I think both Tilda and Vincent, to me, are very intelligent people and very they mindful people. And so I, I was very attracted to him to that. Obviously, he's an amazing actor. And he has that kind of um, uh, organic, fluid, surprising performances that I like most. And then just physically, he fits the role perfectly. Six foot five, 250, big guy. Fritz for the whole football thing and fits for the disassociation that he has with his slightly effeminate son, you know, who looks a lot more like Tilda, which kind of just worked out perfectly. When he, I thought of them three together, I was like, wow, I could, it makes so much sense why he sucks his thumb with Vincent as the dad and Tilda as the mom, you know. Um, so that that's pretty, and you know, when I met him, I think we both hit it off and I think that he sensed in me someone who knew that performances were the most important part of this film. And I wasn't, while I did videos and commercials and stuff like that, I wasn't going for visual shenanigans. I was going for, you know, ordinary people influence me much more than people might think in making this film. Any concern that the audience at any point thinks that Justin is gay? Uh, I don't, cons that wouldn't concern me at all. Like, uh, if he was gay, I'd be like, yay, let's put a, you know, let's say uh, he's gay, but... It isn't what he is. It isn't what he is in the book, you know. And it wasn't the, my my intention. I'm I'm very glad and proud as a as a as a <laughs> as a straight guy who had a had a gay father, and who's not always felt comfortable with different forms of manliness, you know, and struggled to find some place to be me that wasn't like some macho guy and and also isn't gay, it's a weird place, and it's, and it's not easy. And I'm very happy to put Justin out in the world, who's maybe not exactly the kind of, I don't know, it feels like slightly new turf for a guy, or at least turf that I need to see more, let's put it that way. I don't think I reinvented the wheel, but it, he's, he's a sensitive, slightly effeminate, but definitely, you know, horny, straight, white, you know, guy that um, 
I I feel I haven't seen a lot of, you know? And I, I totally embrace all of his femininity, you know? Talk a little bit about you and your father and, and that relationship, of, I mean, just about the family thing, because I'm running for a gay paper. So uh-huh. So. Um, well, my dad came out, you know, my parents were married for like 45 years, and uh, my my mother passed away right before I started making Thumbsucker. And it was, and it was, a lot of ways was the influence or the impetus to start making films finally, to finally say in my life, I'm ready. You know what I mean? Like having her pass was like, life has got to start now in the big game, you know? And strangely, my father passed away as I finished Thumbsucker, you know, five and a half years later. And when my mom passed away, my father came out. And he had been um, gay before, but it was, you know, my f parents are World War II, Depression era, generation born in the 20s. And, uh, you know, he was gay in a world where that just was a very hostile place and not happy to have him be gay. And he wasn't very comfortable with it all. And, and the, the limited life that you could have as a gay person really freaked him out and scared him and wasn't comfortable, you know. And him and my mom were friends since high school. And I, they really did love each other on some levels and tried to work. And God knows exactly what he did for 45 years. He, he was with her and not with other people, you know. But when she came out, and he was 75 years old, he came out like full guns. And not just intellectually, he really wanted to be gay in every way and have a relationship and, and be out, you know. And, uh, and it's very kind of beautiful, sad, crazy part of all of our lives, you know. Um, and um, it's definitely a part of my life because I live with that father figure who like definitely was an odd father figure. He was a closeted gay man, so it was strange male energy to be around. And uh, while I've always felt pretty, you know, uh, uh, at many points in my life it would have been advantageous to be gay, going to art school, being in New York during the kind of art scene and all that. And I never really felt like that was what I was. But uh, at the same time, uh, I can often identify with gay guys more than straight guys just as far as sensibility or interest or stuff like that, or definitely women. I have easier time with women lots. So if the film helps create a little space in that world, I'd be really happy and it'd be a really nice uh, gesture to my dad, you know what I mean? And it means so much to me that he got to come out, even though sometimes it was incredibly annoying because he was just like so gay, you know what I mean? And to have your dad just turn into the... the moment, if you can. Oh, he's just the horniest man you ever met in your life at 75 and just so myopic about being gay and just so everything in the world had to be gay and... And it was a little intensely one one angle on life, you know. And uh, while it's great, and one of my favorite things of my dad ever is he went to this, um, I forgot what it's called, a California Men's Gathering. It's kind of like a, uh, you go into the woods, and, and it's kind of like summer camp, and, and there's a whole bunch of different things you do. And he loved it so much. And, and you, can ma you can imagine how hungry he was, just in all ways, just to be to have the affinity of being around guys where it was okay to be gay and, and he was, you know, he's at the end of his life and he's really trying to get as much as he can. Anyways, there's this picture of all of them. It's kind of like a school picture. And there's my dad wearing like little short shorts, like trying to pull it off, right? And he's, you know, he's like 77 and, and he, in one way he looks very boyish and, and awkward and just crazy and a little embarrassing as a son. In another way it's like, how beautiful, like how amazing that uh and he's so happy you know and he's like beaming and he and looks to me like he's saying i made it you know like i'm here you know so as someone who loves him uh i'm so glad he got there you know what i mean as complicated it was for us it wasn't easy it wasn't always uh, uh the you know it's hard to have your dad be gay <laughs> you know what i mean and just in that you want this myth of of solidity and family togetherness and and all that, and it was clear that my family wasn't ever quite that. You know what I mean? It was some strange negotiation, and I always felt that, and uh, and you always want to be otherwise. You know what I mean? Talk a little bit about Justin and, and uh, his dad, and what, what the, the gap is there. Well, I, I think I think it's funny if you want to keep on this theme, like because uh, um, I did this very purposeful thing where there's a younger brother. Um, and the other brother, I dyed his hair black to look more like Vincent. And the other younger brother is kind of tougher and jockier and, and in a lot of ways more stereotypical, straight kind of jockey guy. And then Justin, I made look a lot more like his mom. They have a similar hair color, similar hair length. 
and Justin's definitely more effeminate, more intellectual, more all these things. So I think you have these two, you know, as father and son, you do tend to look at each other and go, how are we same? How are we different? We are from each other. And it's a very strange mirroring thing. But if you actually don't really look like your dad so much, and if your dad's this much more intense masculine and you're much more feminine, it, it causes a crazy tension between the two of them. And, and it, all these kind of complicated layers, and one layer that I love is that Vincent D'Onofrio is actually quite fragile in this film. He's quite sensitive and quite fragile, and underneath that toughness is a very, you know, sweet, and in some ways you would call him feminine man, you know? And, it's, and it comes out every once in a while, you kind of see it. And we definitely worked on him being delicate in many ways, and him putting lots of sugar in his coffee, and him uh, doing things that kind of combat the great Santini stereotype, you know? Have you ever seen him in, in, in Nunzio's second cousin? Uh-uh, uh-uh. Uh, it's a gay short he does. He, play, he plays a rapidly masculine gay cop with a black lover and a ditzy Italian-American mother. Yeah, 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 yeah. I could see him it's doing that. Amazing piece. Yeah. I mean, I think the great thing about Vincent is, like, he's very attuned to the complications of being human, you know, and, and can rock, can walk different <laughs> levels at one time. You know, like, he's... That's what's really fun as a director is working with people like, like him and Tilda and, and, and Lou who are so um, able to inhabit complication and contradiction, you know? Describe uh, <clears throat> Justin's relationship with the Vince Vaughn character, which I think is a, uh, next to the father. is a very interesting Yeah, I, I guess, you know, in the film, Justin's got his estranged relationship to his real dad, which doesn't work on a lot of levels, even though there's love between them. Um, it doesn't work visually, you know, like they don't seem similar physically and also just communication wise. So Justin during the film finds a couple of different father figures, one being Vince Vaughn, one being Keanu Reeves. And the Vince Vaughn character at the beginning seems to really kind of embrace him in a way that the dad didn't quite. But you, through it you kind of learn that the, the Vince Vaughn character has his own sort of weaknesses, his own thumb sucking, and he's <laughs> getting a little too much out of being peers with these 18, 19 year olds. And he um, is comfortable with Justin when he's weak and falling, and he's the, definitely the leader in helping him, but less comfortable with Justin when he's winning and dominant and maybe a little overbearing. He can't quite handle Justin in a powerful way. And I, I really. T tried very hard to compassionately and sympathetically show all the adults in this film is very flawed. And to say to everybody that that's the way life is, and you know, don't think that as you get to be whatever your idea of adult is, 20, 25, 30, 40, 50, that if you're not fixed, right, perfect, solved, done, that something's wrong with you, you know what I mean? And all the actors kind of agreed with me on that or, or went with that and like definitely Tilda and Vincent were like, you know, how can I be the adult when I'm, I feel like I'm 19 on the inside. I feel like I'm 18 and somehow I'm supposed to take care of all these people. Let me ask you, this is a complicated question. I want to make sure I get the, the, the right part of it. When I talked to Macaulay Culkin, he talked about having to fire his dad from his life. Mm -hmm. and, and I asked him whether or not in some ways it was almost like a spousal relationship because this kid had been following his father professionally. Yeah. And the father was the master coach and everything. Uh, and he said in some ways, yeah, like he knew his father more like if it was a second wife or something. And I'm not wanting to push the Freudian implications of this any further than it should, but it occurs to me that in an adolescent film like this, that the young man is not only looking at his mom as an adult role model, but in some respects he's having a kind of flirtatious relationship with the men in his life, too, the older men who are the father figures. And it's not supposed to be erotically consummated, but he is supposed to define himself and almost be almost in a feminine kind of way towards these men uh, to push the envelope in both directions. And, and with the Keanu Reeves, Vincent D'Onofrio, and uh, Vince Vaughn, you've got the three different male figures which allow the feminine and masculine side of Justin to emerge. Wow. That's great. I, never, I didn't actually really think that. I mean, definitely one part of the film that's key for me is the Oedipal part, which is maybe related to what you're talking about, where Justin is really trying to be the adult peer to his mother in more ways than one. And it's not so much sexual tension, but he's trying to be the man that will keep her at home. Right. And when he's really afraid that she's going to go, he tries to go and save her and meets another male big dad figure, Benjamin Pratt, and has a strange, you know, they actually have a lot of contact and it does have a weird tension between yeah, those guys. 
too. Yeah, exactly. and it's funny, you know, this is adapted from a book, and in the book, the uh, Mr. Geary character, the Vince, is much more gay. It's much more sort of closeted gay, leaking out, you know, and his energy is leaking out, you know, sexually towards Justin. And it, uh, to me, I didn't really want to have that in the film where it wasn't going to be treated more holistically. You know, it would be kind of like a joke in the film. So I just sort of steered away from that. But it's it's interesting that yeah, you're bringing that up. Um, but I never thought of Justin as kind of the female counterpart to all these big t six foot five guys that are in the film. But it, they're all big guys. yeah, they're big and they're and they are very. They don't lack testosterone. You know. All, all of them. They're all definitely guy guys, you know. But Keanu's sort of in the middle ground. Keanu's more um, of a blend, and maybe that's why they kind of connect the most in a strange way. But yeah, and Justin's often in these kind of laying down positions, like in Keanu's chair, or uh, uh, being taught by Vaughn, or you know, obviously with a dad. So that's that's interesting. I hope that's great. I hope people. That's like, you know, as a filmmaker, you hope that people think things like that or it makes you kind of go down roads and tease things out. Um, often I feel like, uh, um, I don't know if you need to hear all this, but, uh, you know, you, you, there's all these previews and all these critics and writers and they go see it and they make a list that you get an email as the director. Mm -hmm. They email you who comes. And then the day after, they email you their short reaction. You know, positive, negative, mixed, blah blah blah, and they're murderous. It's you know, it's a great way to spend time on the floor. Like you just get killed. And I, I finally just stopped, at, you know, saying, "Can you please not send these to me? Because it's just too getting getting written off in these kind of paragraph things." Um, uh, and I've been living in that world for months now of of those kinds of short reactions. So just today is the first day of my like, press tour, and it's been very interesting to have like longer conversations. And diff each one different, but it's like, oh, okay, people, it's not just a lesser than Garden State or another Donnie Darko or whatever the fuck, well, you know. Igby goes down is one of the things that you think about. Yeah, yeah. See, that, see, that, see all these films I don't like. <laughs> the reason for that is that uh, Kieran in, 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 in Igby has to also combat you know, the Jeff Goldblum character, that tough m m male character who ironically turns out to be his biological father, and he loves the man who isn't his biological father. Yeah. So that same paradox and tension between your bonds with these male figures that are important but paradoxical and in some ways dangerous for you. And I yeah. think you, you have a, a somewhat sweeter version of that. His is a very rough version, but it's a somewhat sweeter version. But there are many versions in life. That, yeah, that's what it really yeah. gets down to. Life isn't just one, one yeah, story, one chapter. Yeah. Let me talk quickly about you. I understand you grew up on a skateboard to some degree and you're in that skateboard culture. Talk yeah. a little bit about that. We're in the X Games again. Um, well, skating, you know, skating for me was something that I started doing when I was like 12 and quickly became my whole life and I was on teams and used to compete and but much more than Skating itself is an amazing, free, almost like dance-like thing. That's a great thing to do um, creatively. You, it's a very inventive. It's not a sport, you know. I don't, activity, you know. It's you know, as opposed to like football or tennis or whatever. You're inventing things as you go. You invent tricks. You, it's much more expressive as an individual. But then the culture is also this kind of land of of misfits. This land of people that don't fit into other groups. And so it was great for me not feeling quite in and, you know, so you can, so now you know what my family is like, you just don't feel like everybody else when you come from that family. And especially if your dad's also like, you know, like an art museum director and your mom looks like a man and, you know, just, everything's wrong and crazy and odd, you know. So that world was very comforting and it really was, back then especially, it wasn't as popular as now and it was a land of misfits, which which was a good place to be. Um, and it also, it was a whole culture. Through skating, I learned about punk rock. I met so many people who became artists. And now there's this weird thing where I show at this art gallery called Alleged Gallery, run by this guy named Aaron Rose. And most of the people who are in that gallery are, are all in some way affiliated with skateboarding, or all ex-skaters or whatever. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole huge art world that's kind of documented in this show that's going around the country now called Beautiful Losers. It's a different, it was at Yerba Bueno a while ago. And it, and it really was an incubator for uh, a lot of creativity. So it's, it, to me, it's as, as important as going to Cooper Union, which was my college, and taught me a lot about do-it-yourself, this kind of punk rock ethos 
of which is a lot like independent film like you know you don't need to listen to anybody you don't need to hear anybody tell you it's okay to do it and you don't need to do it by the way the system says just do it yourself for what you believe in you know and and I was around a lot of people who believe that from the age of 13 on you know final question your affinity for Japan and the Japanese culture is getting meshed in the yeah uh, I was lucky to have uh, Sofia Coppola invite me there to do a show, uh, art director show with her. And I do graphic art, and that's kind of where I've come out of. And in Japan, this is so important. And in Japan, you get treated like a star and with a lot of respect and also just a lot of sensitivity for everything you do. And my work just kind of sticks out in Japan, and people like it. So I have a uh, kind of a graphics clothing fabric line there called Humans. And... Uh, and it's a big part of my life, and I'm very, I love Japan. It's a great place, especially for a graphic designer. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you.